how can we be fully attentive if I am doing something which is a very simple task? Naturally, the mind turns to other things that have to be done. That is what a friend has submitted as a question. <coughs> I wonder if we have gone into the issue of what is being attentive. Does attentivity require thought? When I am totally present in what I am doing, when the doing of a task implies pouring the wholeness of my being into that movement, is there any scope for thought to peep in? Attentivity is being totally present, <coughs> not a fragment of you, not a part of you, but the whole of you. And when the wholeness is activated, thought movement, movement of ideation, movement of emotions or sentiments, doesn't seem to have any relevance to that movement. I may have 101 things to do why don't I sit down in the morning and organize my day? Plan things properly, according to their priority, according to their urgency. I organize the day. And one who organizes today has never to worry about tomorrow. If today can be lived non-chaotically, if today can be lived in a conflict-free way, in a relaxed way, once you organize, you are relaxed then there is no burden on the subconscious. You are relaxed on the conscious as well as the subconscious level. One organizes one's whole life, but at least one organizes the today. So if the day is organized, at the beginning of the day, at dawn, then when I do things, maybe a simple task, there is only that profound energy of wholeness that operates. If it's a simple thing, well, it will be done elegantly. It will be done aesthetically. There will be attention to the minutest details. You know, the beauty of life is in the details of, minutest details of daily living. So attentivity does not require thought movement. But our habit is to live superficially. Do one thing physically and psychologically run away from what is being done. 
the movement is done out of habit the movement is gone through mechanistically <clears throat> like a robot like a computer that's why the work is felt like drudgery whether it is manual work or it is intellectual work then we like to find out shortcuts no work is drudgery eh? if one pours one whole being into it you know living in wholeness is living very deeply passionately with all the vitality exercising itself in every look of yours in every word of yours every action of yours attentivity is the attitude of the whole being it's not an intellectual effort i am going to be attentive <coughs> and when the day is organized obviously there is no possibility of distraction you are very well aware what you are going to do in the morning the mid morning the afternoon the evening so one will be attentive if one loves life and living attentivity that sensitivity that vitality of sensitivity comes about when there is love for life when the movements of relationship are not means to an end when your today is not a means to an end that is tomorrow it's not an investment for tomorrow it's not a safeguard against tomorrow today is the eternity the now the here the timeless today the timeless present we meet eternity in what we call the present moment so there is reverence for life there is love for life and you do everything carefully with concern at least some of you might have known j krishna murthy might have seen his videos or listened to him personally studied his books your friend vimala had opportunities of watching him cook a meal watching him do his bed pack or unpack his things shine his shoes what you would call simple tasks of the day and it was marvelous the way krishna ji <clears throat> would pour his vitality his 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 wholeness into cooking a meal or serving it like yehudi menuhin playing the violin or your ravi shankar playing the sitar it's like living music you know 
if you feel that to be alive is a benediction the opportunity to live is a grace of the divine so it is love of life which stimulates the quality of sensitivity which we call attentivity it's not an effort of the brain when you do not like to do something then you require a cerebral effort the child wants to play and it has to go to school so sitting in the class though the child is attracted towards the birds he sees outside the window he has to resist that make an effort and be attentive to what the teacher is teaching when you do not like what you are doing when there is an inner resistance to what has to be done then a conscious effort at being attentive becomes necessary but if you love living with its pain pleasure ugliness beauty sorrows joys humiliations honors the violence and the tenderness of compassion all that dance of duality when you love life when you have reverence for life you are interested in living then attentivity becomes the substance of your being substance of your consciousness what is consciousness and if we are what our consciousness is then why all this struggle for enlightenment or <coughs> seeking transformation why don't we relax in what we are yes why don't we relax in what we are have you heard in the last 3 days anything like seeking enlightenment has the speaker ever mentioned that we are here to seek enlightenment spirituality is not an acquisitive movement there is nothing to acquire there is everything to understand there is everything to perceive to learn to understand whoever talked about seeking enlightenment seeking god here in this room in the last 3 days you seek what is known and the divinity or the wholeness of life defies you are categories of known and unknown it is beyond the known and the unknown it is beyond your measurements and even the word immeasurableness it's a marvelous isness which knows no past tense <clears throat> so first of all let us be very clear that in this gathering we are not talking about seeking enlightenment liberation etc divinity is not something static enlightenment is not something static there are no blueprints of transformation that you can move towards them in a direction 
with certain cooked up techniques and methods. Divinity is dynamic. Life is infinite. It's not a destination located in time and space that you can reach and obtain. It's ever moving, ever manifesting. There is emergence out of the wholeness and merging back into the wholeness. It's the wholeness containing innumerable energies and their cosmic dance, their action, their interaction, their blending together, producing different energies. It's a marvelous dance. How can you seek it? And if divinity is the perfume of that wholeness, how can you seek God? Can you seek peace, which is the byproduct and perfume of a whole way of living? Can you seek love? Can you seek freedom? You can be aware of the habits, the conditionings, the limitations and eliminate them. Maybe the elimination of limitations, conditionings, inhibitions brings about the manifestation of freedom, which is the nature of life. When the attachments, infatuations, obsessions are eliminated, then perhaps love shines. Love, which is the nature of life. It cannot be sought. So my friends, enlightenments or transformations or gods or divinities or whatever, it's not something to be sought, not something to be obtained, achieved, secured as an experience. It's something to be seen, to be understood and to live with, to live in. What is consciousness? Is not consciousness a creative energy? When we see life around us, we see movement of an intelligent energy, which seems to have order built in its, built in its movement. So consciousness seems to be creative energy permeating whole life. It permeates our beings also, but through civilization and culture, we have conditioned some part of that energy. What entitles me to say some part of it? Because we go through certain phenomena every day which tells us that the whole of consciousness has not been conditioned. We go to sleep at night. The conditioned consciousness, the I consciousness, the self, the me, the ego.
goes into non-action unless we are dreaming. In profound sleep, the center is non-operative. And yet, the rejuvenation, the revitalization of the whole body takes place through the night. You are not revitalizing. You are not exercising. You are not operating the you, the me. And a holistic growth takes place. In the total relaxation of the body and the psychological structure, growth takes place. Due to the unconditioned energy, due to that unconditioned consciousness, creativity, obviously, Growth cannot take place without creativity. It's creative energy that can bring about holistic growth simultaneously in the whole body. Every one of us goes through moments of love which cannot be manipulated, maneuvered. It cannot be awakened through methods or techniques. It just dawns upon the heart. It invades the consciousness. So it entitles us to say, that in our consciousness there are energies that have not been conditioned. There are moments when suddenly sorrow makes an onslaught, invades and one finds oneself in a state of utter humility, not helplessness, but utter humility, becomes aware of the limitations of the human species. Humility, beauty, love, profound sleep and vitalization that takes place during the sleep, all these are indications. The divine makes its presence felt through so many events in our daily life. If we are not obsessed with the man-made world, its problems, If we are not obsessed with self-pity or self-inflicted misery and suffering, then every day we will notice how the divine, how the creative energy, how the cosmic intelligence makes its presence felt to us. If we have a relationship of relaxation with the known, the past, the knowledge, the experience, etc., it's a relationship of relaxation. Then we feel a kind of inner space, a non-chaotic, non-anarchical, relaxed relationship with the known. <clears throat> it makes us aware of the space inside us and peace blossoms in that awareness. 
in that relaxation. So consciousness, as far as the human species is concerned, is conditioned to some extent, but there is unconditioned potential. We, may, we might call it the unknown energy, the unconditioned energies. I don't know what words to use. And it is those trans-psychological energies like love, like humility, like innocency, like sorrow, like joy. It's these energies that visit us occasionally when we are attentive, when we are sensitive, that enable us to question the validity of the self, the me, the ego. We are turning to the third question now. If we are dominated by ego, what is it in us that prompts us to question the validity of the ego? That's how the question has been framed by someone. It is the touch and go of these trans-psychological energies, unconditioned energies in our daily living, which enable us to question what this I, the me, the self is, what is its mechanism, how does it operate, It is the touch of the unknown, the unconditioned, that gives us, that entitles us, that enables us to question the validity of the known. Validity in the sense, equating the known with the wholeness of life. Equating the conditioned part of our life with the wholeness of our life. If we did not go through that marvelous phenomenon of profound sleep every night and wake up in the morning fresh and vitalized, if our sleep is not an extension of what we do in the day, if we are not dreaming all the time, dreams are extensions of half-lived moments. Half-done things, unfulfilled desires, suppressed wishes, repressed instincts, and so on. So, for most of us, nights are spent in extending what we have been doing in the so-called waking consciousness. And dreams eat into the vitality of your being, then you don't feel fresh in the morning. But if the day has been lived in an organized, orderly, beautiful way, precisely, accurately, with care, concern, with all the vitality at your command, if you have gone through the day, if you have been meeting the eternity through the day, in every challenge, in every relationship, then the nights confer upon you profound sleep, innocent, profound, dream-free, then you are at the deepest layer of your being, as it were. And the creativity 
the supreme intelligence which operates outside in the cosmos operates in the night isn't that a marvelous phenomenon it's a mysterious phenomenon so it is such phenomena such events occurring daily that naturally create an inclination to ask what is this i the self the ego how did it get created created and so on if you don't mind let us proceed to another question sometimes i find myself living with faith in faith connected with the wholeness and sometimes i feel entirely disconnected with the wholeness why does it happen what is this movement of lapse of faith why this movement of being disconnected from the wholeness shall we ask ourselves what is faith may we distinguish it from belief you read books and you can gather beliefs and ideas in theories you attend congregations listen to preachers sermons temples synagogues mosques churches and you gather belief belief in something predetermined predefined by those who have gone before us their theories their conclusions based on their experiences of course you read philosophies and out of the wisdom of philosophers you have convictions or you have beliefs so beliefs convictions etc are related to the known and experienced by others and you seem to agree with their conclusions you feel intellectually in agreement with them and then you grasp it and it becomes your belief not your experience unless you try to administer some chemicals and induce the state of experience described by them that can be done consciousness expanding drugs and chemicals and so on and so on we have been playing with that we have been playing with the tenderest part of our being our consciousness manipulation shakti path yogic manipulation tantric manipulations and so on manipulated experiences are aberrations psychic aberrations
you are raping your consciousness in order to go through experiences. And forgive me, but it seems to be a crime against consciousness. It doesn't result in growth. It doesn't get correlated to the wholeness of your being. It doesn't get assimilated and doesn't get converted into the substance of your consciousness. It remains a foreign element. And this is said more out of agony than in a spirit of criticism. One has wandered across the globe 30 long years and 10 years before those 30 years in that vast subcontinent India and 40 long years one has come across the degradation and human consciousness brought about by such grafting, such manipulations, maneuverings, whether through chemicals, drugs, or tantra, mantra, yoga, and their manipulations. The beauty, the virginity of the consciousness gets violated. The damage is done to handsome young people. Mind you, thousands of them, not hundreds. So it's a bleeding heart that is talking to you. Not in a spirit of criticizing, condemning but sharing the agony in the name of spirituality, in the name of religion. Many crimes have been committed. As politicians commit crimes in the name of politics. They keep good company to each other. <laughs> so, faith is obviously not a belief or a conviction. If at all I am awake, if I have not converted myself into a machine for projecting and propagating the past. Selected patterns out of the past. If I am awake and I look around, then I see the dance of creative energies around me. I feel those energies. When I look at the sun, stand in the sunshine, sunlight, I feel the creativity. The rays of the sun bring the light and the heat, the vitamins. I see the creativity. If I have ever sown some seeds, done some gardening, if not agriculture, I have done agriculture personally, rice plantation with knee deep, in knee deep water with gum boots and all. <laughs> While I was working in the land gift movement, collecting land, distributing land, working for the rehabilitation of the landless tillers, I used to work with them in the fields. I have worked with the villagers in damming rivers, building dams, working with the poorest of the poor in India, ten long years. So I don't say to you anything out of books, 
I have read only one book and that is Book of Life. <laughs> I'm still reading it. <laughs> still learning, still learning, still studying because living is a movement of learning. And every day you learn something, you discover something and there is such an ecstasy. <coughs> so, you look around, if you are awake, if you are interested in finding out what life is, and you see the creativity in the earth, you sow the seeds, and you get bountiful. Not in proportion to the quantity sown by you. The creative energy in the earth, the creative energy in the rays of the sun, the moon, the creative energy in the rains. You see all that. And this movement of creativity by which you are surrounded creates what you call faith. That life is permeated by creative energy, energy of intelligence, energy of love. Intelligence and love cannot be separated anyhow. <clears throat> so it is perception and understanding that awaken the dimension of faith which is invincible. You can change beliefs. Today you read Hinduism, you get certain kinds of beliefs. Tomorrow you read Buddhism, you get another set of beliefs. Day after tomorrow, Zen Buddhism, and again the belief changes. You come across teachers in spirituality, teachers in courts. And you get influenced, you get infatuated with them, and you change your beliefs. Faith is something which is rooted in understanding which comes about through direct perception and therefore it doesn't change. It's much deeper. Beliefs are on the superficial level. And in the shallow waters of beliefs and convictions we feel gratified. We bring about changes there, in those shallow waters. But faith is something you are own. It is not based on the knowledge and experience of others. It is rooted in your own perception. And it gives depth and intensity to everything that you do. And that should suffice for the morning. <laughs> In September, <clears throat> there has been a nervous breakdown Now, there is a sense of emptiness, no sensations, but sometimes there is a feeling of being on a road without a map. What does one do? First of all, if there has been 
a nervous breakdown one should not expose oneself to such intensive gatherings or camps if the nerves are shaky if the nervous system is exhausted it could become very difficult for them to stand exposure to the truth or analysis of facts you need strength and vitality of the nervous system even to listen to the description verbal description of truth or reality exposure to analysis of facts the analysis may not be pleasant it could be painful and if the nerves are shaky why should we torture them with such an exposure one should keep away from all cerebral exertion spend time in creative hobbies music gardening or take long walks or go swimming dancing etc so that the nerves get toned up you know this is not this is not very pleasant situation when we gather together and analyze what life is we probe and dig into ourselves find out our shortcomings distortions perversions to look at the facts requires an austerity so if i have gone through a nervous breakdown i would keep away from such gatherings i would keep away from any serious discussion sufficient cerebral rest dietary changes to tone up the nerves there is a feeling of emptiness because the brain might be too exhausted to work there could be a feeling of being lost or on a road without map because the vision gets blurred so one should be very kind to oneself not expect too much of oneself the mad neurotic society in which we have to live the stress and strain that we have to go through living in an industrially advanced society already that takes toll on our neurochemical system so one should not tax oneself trying to find out a map of life rest relaxation and toning up the being 
That's what I would do if I were in the questioner's position. You talk of self-education, purification, growth, then is illumination gradual or sudden? Isn't insight timeless? That is second question. One does talk of self-education, which is a process of purification requiring time because one sees that the organism has lost sensitivity, it has lost vitality, So before it gets exposed to the occurrence of illumination or insight, it has to be sensitized, it has to be equipped with an inner balance. Imbalances, impurities have to be washed out of the being, as you wash out the toxins from your blood. When the organism is in a state of sensitivity, when the organism is in a state of sensitivity, receptivity and is capable of precise perception, not perception polluted by preferences or prejudices, not perception contaminated by the authority of theories and ideologies, but a sheer, simple perception. When the organism is in a state of sensitivity for such a pure perception to take place, then it results in communion with facts, leading to understanding of truth, which appears like a flash of illumination. The flash of illumination, the flash of understanding, does not require time. It is timeless. But for that to occur, the organism has to be equipped and self-education or the process of purification for the holistic growth to take place, holistic maturity to take place, <coughs> is gradual. There was a boy called Ramana in South India he was 12 years old, studying with his elder brother in a city called Madurai. And one evening, when the two brothers were studying together, this boy Raman asks his brother, elder brother, what will happen when we study and get through examinations? Oh, well, we'll be able to have a degree, 
what will happen then? We'll be able to get a job and earn our livelihood. And Ramana says, he asks a question, will it uncover the mystery of life? Will it disclose the truth, the meaning of life and death to me? And his brother laughs and says, no, no, no. This education is not going to do that. The night passes and in the morning the elder brother doesn't find the younger brother. The boy has disappeared. He did not want to continue that education. Understanding had taken place. So he went to Arunachalam. and entered a cave and lived there. It took him six years for the inner revelation to happen. So you see, insight is timeless in one way. It is timeless in the sense that it succeeds the event of understanding. But the event of understanding requires personal, first-hand, intimate encounter with the fact. That encounter takes place when there is the openness and receptivity. Our eyes may be open and we may not see. We may be awake and we may not listen. We may hear the words, but we may not listen to the meaning conveyed by the words. So illumination is not gradual, but growth is gradual. And illumination, in quotes, I am using the word used by the questioner. Illumination is not something that occurs only at one moment and then it's over. With every discovery of truth, with every event of learning, there is illumination. There is light and there is clarity. There was a boy called Jiddu Krishnamurti. Whom the Theosophical Society took over in 1911. 1909 rather, but his education began in 1911. Holistic education. And it was in 1925 in Ohio, in Arya Vihara, that the young man said, I have met my beloved. We are no more separated. Life is my beloved. Now what would you say? Was it gradual? Was it sudden? The process of education went on from 1911 to 1925 and the process of purification went on up to 1980. So let us not be carried away by words. Perception of truth, understanding of reality may occur in a timeless moment. And yet, slowly it percolates through all the layers of being. Time is required to correlate it 
with all your activities, in all the fields of action, at all the levels of consciousness, that correlation, that coordination, then you see the enlightenment or illumination as a fully blossomed flower. So perception is not sufficient. Understanding is not sufficient. Understanding has to be lived. The truth understood has to be lived. Then what you call the transformation or enlightenment or what have you, manifest itself through the whole being. It requires dedication. Dedication to our own understanding. Understanding of ourselves. Understanding of society. Understanding of truth or the nature of reality. to live that understanding at any and every cost. That's what dedication implies. To let the untruth drop away. It's not difficult to understand the truth, but we cling to the untruth. The untruth does not cling to us. We hold on to it, we cling to it. Please do see this. This is our life. And it is the clinging to the untruth, the false, that does not allow the understanding that has taken place to percolate into all the layers of our being and blossom out like a full-blown flower manifesting beauty in every petal and emanating the perfume of love and compassion. We try to live a dual life, a double life catering to the value structure, norms and criteria of the society at one level. And inwardly, we want to live and we imagine that we are living beyond limitations, beyond conditioning, beyond divisions and fragmentations. And we owe allegiance to fragmentation to compartmentalization, knowing that it is false. So we are torn within, not exactly schizophrenic, but the homogeneous wholeness of our being doesn't get a chance to operate. It remains suspended in our memory. And a faint awareness somewhere So this contradiction has to be eliminated. This gap has to be bridged. That is what is implied by the term dedication to the understanding that has taken place. It is our habit to form judgments about one another 
and that activity goes on even when we have come here together for a camp. Would you comment? That's a question. We have come here together for how long? One week, 10 days? Not more. Maybe we have a habit of judging one another, always forming a valid judgment about others, according to our favorite criteria, or likes and dislikes and whatever. But we have come here only for 10 days. Can't we hold back our preferences and prejudices even for 10 days? Leave aside the question of transcending the mind, going beyond the ego. <laughs> Throw those words out of the window. But can't we hold back our judgments, our preferences, likes, dislikes, even for 10 days? When people from different countries, different climates, different fields of activity come together. There are going to be temperamental differences, temperamental idiosyncrasies, peculiarities, bound to be. And when you live together 24 hours, those things are exposed. But I think Coming for an intimate gathering or camp like this implies, does it not, that even if the value judgments get formed because of our habit, we keep them close to our chest and not verbalize them, at least. Not get together in two or three or four and talk about things. Ten days of life. Brushing aside our preferences, our likes, our judgments. Watch and observe others, their peculiarities. As you watch the clouds of an evening sky, as you watch the bright sunshine on fresh grass, green grass, the trees and their changing of colors due to fall. Don't you watch all that, observe all that. Why not observe one another in that non-personal way we are not going to spend our lives together with one another. And who knows, we may not meet one another again. So why this concern about judging one another? I have been in such camps and in every camp I find distinction of insiders and outsiders. And who is right and who is wrong. Would you help us to understand these divisions Etc., etc. It's a long question. <laughs> long question. There, there are some divisions and there is some harshness in this camp. Another question. What can I say? 
except for these meetings, I am in bed. I have to keep in bed, preserving every ounce of energy so that I can serve you. I can communicate with you. I can respond to your queries. But look, there are groups of friends of Vimala in different countries who organize camps. They are not professional organizers of camps. <laughs> they, they do it once in two years, four years, five years. I have come here after four years to USA. And I'm sorry, but this is going to be my last visit to USA. My travelings of 40 years are going to terminate next year. <clears throat> so, whether here in Boston, or in California, or in Holland, Poland, other countries, Italy, they are not professional organizers of camps. They are private citizens very much interested in developing an alternative way of life and living in their own lives. They have some love and respect for a person called Vimala, and they feel a concern that others also should get an opportunity to listen to her. So they come together. The organizing group may be big, some may be active, some may be extending moral support, and you know, Groups, they organize. It's not easy to organize camps. Rosanna had uh, organized in Rome. My friends are there, who organize in Poland, let's say, and Anita in Holland, and so on. In California, Geneva is there. Grace is there and others, you know, Nancy. All private citizens doing it out of love and concern. So everything cannot be perfect. And these organizers, maybe during the camp, have to get together. I don't know, but they have to get together and talk things over, discuss things over. There's not a question of insider and outsider. We are not in the organizing group, so you and me, we are outsiders. We are here as participants. We can offer our cooperation, we can extend our cooperation, say, if you need any help, please let us know. We can throw in suggestions if you want certain things corrected or changed, we can throw in suggestions. I don't know about Boston here, but in other countries, and especially in India, the organizers get together every evening to take stock of things, what has happened in the day. Are any changes necessary? They discuss things. Not all the organizers say if there are 15 or 20, maybe four or five who are very active, who have taken the executive responsibility. It's no question of insider or outsider. That feeling should not arise. It's very sad that such a feeling arises. It's not a question of who is right and who is wrong. <coughs> But after all, things would be organized according to the understanding, the capacity of the organizers. With all their limitations and talents, it is they who have to act. Here you are only 35 or 36 or whatever. In Holland, generally we are 200. In Poland last year in August, we were 80, weren't we, let's say? About 75 or 80 from 10 different East European countries. We were about 80 in Chile, where I could not attend even one meeting. 
I used to write down and give from Brazil, from Argentina, from Chile, from Peru, and so on. International gathering in South America. <coughs> so to feel that we are not consulted, we have not been, you know, referred to. Just 10 days of life. And if there is such a feeling, organizers should not be very touchy. <laughs> they should not react. <laughs> they have taken the responsibility upon themselves. So there will be criticism, constructive, destructive. You know the human nature. <laughs> a housewife cannot please all. <laughs> and the organizers are in the position of a housewife. It should be an occasion of sharing. It's, it should be an occasion of joy that persons from so many countries can come together. You are here from Canada, from the West Coast, from Norway, from Denmark, from Holland, Poland, Italy, you know, so many countries. If you want to understand one another, there can be exchange of experiences, sharing. These opportunities are very rare. And if life confers such opportunities upon us, we shouldn't waste them. I was hesitating to take these questions, but they have been given in writing to me and I sit here to respond to them. <clears throat>